If tomorrow starts without me, there's something you should know. While I hold you close, never let you go. Hello and welcome to The Broken Pack, a podcast focused on giving adult survivors of sibling loss a platform to share their stories and to be heard, something that many sibling loss survivors state that they never have had. Sibling loss is misunderstood. The Broken Pack exists to change that and to support survivors. I'm your host, Dr. Angela Dean. In this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Julie about the loss of her sister and to suicide. We also discussed how the kindness of a stranger and connecting with others has helped her in her loss, as well as where she is and what she wishes she had had in her grief. Content warning, information presented in this episode may be triggering to some people. It contains talk of suicide and substance use. Resources are located in the show notes. You never know, you just never know. So would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Julie and I'm 42 years old and I am a mom of a seven-year-old Milo and a four-year-old JJ. I am working at a Montessori school and I do subbing and administrative help. I'm from Oregon and I live in Oregon. Thank you for that introduction. Before we get started talking about your loss, I wonder what you wanted me and the listeners to know about your sister. Yeah. So Anne, Anne Marie, um, she was about almost two years older than me and she was beautiful, spunky. She definitely marched to the beat of her own drummer always. She was charismatic. She was brilliant. And if she were here right now, she would argue that I was always the one that got the A. So I was very quote unquote book smart. And she was just plain smart. She could tell you like Mm. all the justices in different states. She was very politically aware. She loved reading and learning about different cultures and history. And she was just like a sponge. She was very smart. She had a lot of knowledge and she definitely had no problem showing off that knowledge. (laughs) She was just a very interesting person to be around. It was never a dull moment. She got into trouble a lot because that happens with people who Mm. are just big personalities. She loved breaking barriers and breaking rules and just like was a very intense person. And all of that, it, it rolls very nicely into her labels that she got as a child, for better or worse, ADHD, potentially Mm -hmm. bipolar, depressive, all of that. And yet just an amazing human to be around. So, yeah. Sounds like a really, like you said, an amazing human. What was your relationship like with her? Yeah. So I don't really, I have very, a very poor memory of my youth, but my mom And dad told me that we got along really well. We played together really well. And I think it was maybe late elementary school, early junior high and high school where, you know, she just definitely needed to do her own thing. So we had started having troubles then. I was the annoying Mm -hmm. little sister. She was the one who just had big ideas and, and I didn't really fit into those. She felt like whatever was mine was her. So we got in a lot of arguments about, hey, those are my shoes. Hey, that's my makeup. Unfortunately, I think because of her kind of confidence and esteem issues, there was some bullying. And so I reacted to that. So we had a very tumultuous like tween and adolescence, tween years and adolescent years together. And then we did our own thing in our 20s and and we really came back to each other in our late 20s and early 30s. At that point, she she needed a lot of support. She had a lot of issues and addictions, food, cigarettes, drugs, alcohol, so many things. And, you know, she kind of, yeah, we just bonded over that because I had similar patterns, but never to the degree she did. So we could talk to each other. We had the same upbringing. We, we were able to cash things out together and mm-hmm. being sisters was something that that nobody else had besides us with each other. So, so we really started Mm -hmm. coming back 
to each other and I would visit her at rehab and it was like a beautiful, beautiful time. And then that's when it ended. Mm. Do you have other siblings? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have. Excuse me. You said I was going to cry. You were right. <laughs> Take your time. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I have an older brother. His name is Mike. He's 12 years older than me. And he's also profoundly deaf and had been since birth. So he was often at boarding schools and things. So we definitely saw him, but he wasn't really as much of the picture in terms of the sibling sibling group. He didn't really grow up mm-hmm. with me in a lot of ways. And of course, we love him very much, but just didn't have the same relationship, unfortunately, with him that I did mm-hmm. with Aunt. And he was significantly older than both of you, it exactly. sounds like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So... Almost like an only child and then the two of you. (laughs) Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It sounds like the relationship with you and Anne, is it Anne or Emery? Well, it's Anne. Yeah. So it sounds like the relationship with you and Anne changed over time with adolescence. That's normal, what we would expect. Mm. I think in your writing to me, it sounded like over recent years, it changed again. Right. Like in her to last closer. few years, we got a lot closer. And I really owe that to a friend of mine. He's from Lebanon and he was, this was like a couple of years before, maybe three or four years before she died. And I just, in, we were just talking about families and our siblings and in passing, I'm like, yeah, I haven't really talked to Anne. And like, I don't know, maybe it's been a year. And he was just like shocked. He's like, how... You have to, Mm -hmm. like, even if (laughs) you've had a rocky past and even if Mm -hmm. you don't get along and even if your personalities aren't the same, like you, this is one of your most important relationships. You need to talk to your sister. And so I reached out to her and I'm just so grateful to him. And I've told him as much because since then we did become closer and start valuing our histories and how important that is to to have such a shared bond and shared parents and (laughs) all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And your parents are still alive. They are. Yeah, they are. And okay. they're wonderful. Yeah, they're they're very present in my life and my children's lives. And it's just amazing. Yeah. So thank you for sharing all of that. I am wondering what you would like me or the listeners to know about the story of losing Anne. Yeah. Well, it was very traumatic. She She died by suicide, which... It's interesting. I've listened to a lot of your your interviews and it's not uncommon, sadly. <laughs> when you lose a sibling yeah. middle age, it seems to be that suicide is maybe one of the, the top reasons. So yeah, so she she had been in and out of rehab for a few years, really struggled with alcohol addiction and her food addiction and just her depression and all all of those things just I think came to a head and a year before she died she and I were talking and she she told me I think I might jump off the golden gate bridge and I knew that was serious cuz I know when they tell you a plan it, it's to be taken mm-hmm. seriously so we, I mm-hmm. told her I loved her we're all here for her all the things and then yeah so one of my last interactions with her my first child Milo was born she came to visit him she was drunk I don't know if I can fully blame it on her. At some point, baby almost fell. So I don't know if like she dropped Mm -hmm. him or in the passing him back to me. It just wasn't. But she was drunk. So I think she thought that I was upset. I wasn't upset. Um, But I also had this ink like I wanted to email her after she had left and say, hey, listen, no worries. You're fine. It's fine. We're all good. Mm -hmm. And after a conversation with my husband who brought up the point of like, hey, she she needs some space. She articulated many times that sometimes having a family who is so loving and so supportive and so just never giving up on her was actually hard for her because she had a very low sense Mm -hmm. of self-worth and didn't feel like she deserved all of this support. And so I was like, I hear that. So maybe I'll just let her reach out to me. And then she never did. And then three months later, I did see her one more time at my father's 70th birthday party. And then three months later, I got a call from my dad at work. And he said, you need to come home. And I said, well, can you just tell me over the phone? And he said, no. And so I was like, okay, something's obviously wrong. And 
you know, it was interesting on the drive Mm -hmm. back to his house, I was going through all the things. Okay, if somebody's dying, I literally went through this mental list of if somebody must be dead, I hope it's this person first and this person next and this person next, because I don't know, for some reason that ritual really stuck out with me. And and in a way, I felt guilty about it, but I was categorizing it by who is the most important in my life. And it was a very unconscious Mm -hmm. kind of thing, but I knew it wasn't good, whatever I was about to come to. So, Mm -hmm. you know, he... He shared with me the news and that she had she had jumped off the bridge like she said she was going to. And um, Bob, um, my mom was a flight attendant and she was in Hawaii at the time. So my dad was able to get a hold of the airline who got a hold of her and she got off her plane in Hawaii. And they told her she was just hysterical in the airport, hours and hours away from us. And, just the whole so traumatic. So traumatic. Mm, that sounds definitely. Anyway. She was alone, and yeah, she was alone. But as a mother, now I can't even imagine. But you know what? She came back and she said she was so grateful because so many people were just loving her and hugging her and giving her water and supporting her. So she wasn't really alone. Mm-hmm. Any mother would have gone over to her and helped take care of her, which they did. So, so yeah, so she came back and Anne, Anne had actually flown all the way from Philadelphia to San Francisco with this plan oh. in her mind and didn't pick up her luggage from the, the baggage claim. And so that was returned to us and we were just desperately hoping for a note and there wasn't one. So we just put mm-hmm. the pieces together, yeah. which we we knew she was depressed and that she was having just such a hard time with her, her addictions. And, uh, and yeah, so that's the story. And then we all went to San Francisco and we took a, a little, uh, we actually have like boats that go out and you can spread ashes in the San Francisco Bay. And she loved San Francisco. Mm-hmm. It's her favorite city in the world. So we, we did that. That was the end. I'm so sorry. That does sound awfully tragic. I don't think I realized that when you messaged me that the story about going to the bridge wasn't, was that at the same time that you went to spread the ashes? No, it was about a year later. Yeah. Year and a half later. Oh. So in the immediate aftermath, did you feel supported? Yes. Yes and no. I was I was in so much shock. I didn't really know how the thought of am I supported or not just wasn't even there. <laughs> it was just like mm-hmm. I was so oh, in, of course. in the middle. Right. Of mm-hmm. But my sister-in-law, so my husband's sister, just was incredible. When she found out, she didn't even ask. She just flew up from Denver because I had a brand new baby, a four-month-old baby. She flew up from Denver. Mm-hmm. And took my baby. It was just, you do what you need to do. I am here. It's just the biggest showing of love. Mm-hmm. You know, because my husband and I were recently married and I'd maybe seen her three times in my life or something. And that's what she did. And it was just such a generous and powerful display of support. And so, yeah, she just took care of Milo while I wailed in my bedroom and got her obituary mm-hmm. ready, like all the things that need to happen after someone dies. And so that was amazing. My parents, of course, we were fully supportive of each other and fully grieving our own grief. And so I never felt like I needed more from them and they didn't feel like they needed more from me. In fact, if anything, they were just like checking in on me all the time. I was like, dude, Mm -hmm. we're good. Don't worry about me. (laughs) And Yeah. And then another person at work who really supported me is just this one nurse who like came up to me and was just when I was alone in my office. And she's just like, if you need anything at all you need to go home early, you're good. And and everyone else, and I'm not blaming them at all. You don't know what to say to somebody when this kind of thing happens. But everyone else is just like, right. Nothing. It was like nothing. It was like, it wasn't like they were like, hey, Julie, like chipper, but everyone just put their head down, mm-hmm. right? Because they're like, they don't want to hurt, to like hurt me by opening up anything. And so everyone's just being very careful. But I really appreciated just that very simple, kind gesture of, I acknowledge mm-hmm. you and I know this really hard for you to be back at work after a week so and then of course the story I told you about with the woman I went to the bridge with about a year and a half later 
she also lost a sibling to addiction. And so we just instantly had a bond and I didn't know the woman. I don't really know her now. We just had this amazing bonding journey to the Golden Gate Bridge together so I could throw some flowers off and think about her and be with someone who who got it, you know. So those were Mm -hmm. the big supports I look back on on that time. Yeah. How did you meet her? So I have to be a little careful because I worked at a medical clinic and I don't want to say her name because I haven't asked her permission to share, but she No, I understand. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She was a patient at the clinic (laughs) and I was working checkout and she was checking out from her appointment and her name struck me as the character in a book that my sister loved. It was her favorite book. It was about siblings, really. And my sister wanted me to read it and I never did until she died. And I really regret that because she and I would have really had a nice conversation about about this book. Anyway, it was a character in the book and I asked her about it. She said, oh yeah, my dad loved this book. And he named me after that character because she's such a strong woman. And I was like, wow. And I told mm-hmm. her about my sister and how she loved the book and how she died by suicide by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. And she started crying. I was like, oh my God, my brother died by a drug overdose like a year ago. And this just very quickly culminated into like a very deep bond. And I mentioned one day when I feel brave enough, I'd like to go to the bridge and throw off some flowers. And she was like, I'm going with you. Her husband used his miles or whatever points to get us there. And we did mm-hmm. within That's like sweet. a month. It was incredible. It was magic. Yeah. Nothing short of magic. Yeah. And then even the Uber ride that you. Yes. Yeah. So previously. we spent a whole day in San Francisco visiting my sister's old stomps in her old apartment and or the, the building and we got an Uber to the bridge. And when we were pulling up to the bridge, this song came on, which I'd never heard, but it's a hip hop song by this band named Logic. And the title is the suicide hotline phone number. And the lyrics in the beginning are like, I don't want to be alive. I want to die right now. And I turned around, she was in the back seat, and I looked at her like with the most intense look. And I was like, what the heck? <laughs> and she, we were both just like shocked. We can see the bridge in full view. And here's the singer on the radio in this random Uber talking about, I don't want to be alive. I want to die today. It was crazy. Mm-hmm. Like the whole, the whole day, the whole experience was just like sign after sign after sign after sign of like, Anne was wild. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really moment. Well, thank you for sharing that. That idea that people weren't there, didn't know what to say to you. Mm-hmm. I've been thinking a lot about that. Lately, and I was at a conference recently in which people were talking about how so many people don't know what to say. And that we watched a documentary that I highly recommend called Speaking Grief. They did a a version of this, but there were several speakers that talked about how people just will see you in a public space and turn around and walk away. So it's not like we're so not comfortable talking about grief and loss. And then I think if you add in this component of sibling loss. Nobody knows what to say to you. I'm glad that you had some support. Where are you with that now? Yeah, it's interesting. Now, whenever I want to talk to my parents, I can. Like, open door all the time. Mm -hmm. And whenever her name comes up, which is often, we'll just have a little tear, have a little cry, and then we keep moving. Mm -hmm. It's. I kind of wish, I don't talk to my friends about it. Even my friends who knew her, I'm a, if it comes up, I'm the one that brings it up. And sometimes, and I don't blame them for this because they haven't had this experience and hopefully they won't have to. Because one of my best friends is like her sis, like we go, she and her sister and me go on monthly hikes. And I just look at them and I'm like, God, how lucky they are. Right. And so maybe that's why mm-hmm. they don't want to bring it up. They don't want me to feel bad. It's already kind of like, yeah, here's my awesome sister that I'm best friends with and our kids are best friends. With. But I'm not like a bitter person. But when it comes up with them, it's me bringing it up. When it comes up with any of my friends, it's me bringing it up because it's May and I think about her in May or because it's her birthday and I think about her on her birthday. So sometimes I guess if I really think about it, I would just, it would, it would feel good if my friends were just like, by the way, how are you doing with Anne? Do you want to talk about it or you want to tell me something about how it's going? And again, I don't blame them for not. I don't know if I would. And I'm sure there's a million things I'm missing and not checking in with my friends about death or not. But so that would feel good. But I'm still every now and then I communicate with some of Anne's friends who weren't my friends, but they were Anne's friends. And 
I, I know I can always bring her up with them because they'll be happy to mm-hmm. share a story or tell me how much they loved her. But yeah, it just doesn't come up in my daily life too much anymore. It's been seven years. So. Mm-hmm. Oh, well. Yeah. How are the anniversaries each year for you? They're special. So her birthday, we often celebrate. Sometimes we'll have some of her friends over. Sometimes I'll just think about her. We'll raise a glass like if we're if I'm with my parents. But then her her death anniversary is actually May 24th. And I do something different every year. I've gone to San Francisco twice now. I, I'm going again this year. Just I don't know why. It's morbid, but feels good to be in her city and in her space. And I buy a book, or two, one book each for my children every year for Anne's Day. And I I sign it the date and Anne's Day. And one day they'll know what that means. But she was an avid reader. Mm-hmm. She just read read about everything. So I felt like a good way to honor her and keep her connected to her nephews would be to to buy them books. So we have the whole collection of Anne's Day books. And so I, that's like a little tradition. We check in with my parents and at the time she died, we always call each other and just let the silence happen mm-hmm. during that time. And So yeah, we have some little rituals that feel pretty good. But of course it's sad. May is always like a just get through this month kind of situation. Yeah. It sounds like you're finding ways to stay connected to her through those things that you're doing and also sharing her with your sons. That's mm-hmm. quite beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, we try. <laughs> my When my oldest son was like three or four, we, of course, he always heard about Tantan, Tantan, my father's French. And so Anne did not want to be called aunt. She was very against that. So we're like, fine, Tant, <laughs> which is like the French word for for aunt. Right. So Tauntaun is how they know her by. And he was like, how did Tauntaun die? And I was like, she died of a very big sadness, like more than you've ever felt, like like a real big sadness. And that's kind of all they know right now. But mm-hmm. I'm going to be very transparent with them and talk to them about, hey, this is in our family and we need to be really careful when we need to, yeah. to take this seriously. So we'll get there. Obviously not yet. <laughs> Pretty young. How old but are they now? Sure. Seven and four. Oh, okay. Yeah. Probably not the time to share that with them. No. And of course, I have a, a huge fear that I don't want to give them any ideas. I, I worry. And I didn't even want children for the longest time because I'm like, man, we're screwed up. I had an eating disorder. <laughs> I smoked cigarettes. I dabbled with drugs. I like don't drink alcohol anymore because I wasn't alcoholic per se, but it never went well. So I've been 11 years sober. And so, yeah, I got my own things. My sister clearly had her own things. And they say a lot of that is genetic. And my parents, shockingly, are like the most quote unquote normal people. So I don't really know what the heck happened <laughs> with us, but they don't either. <laughs> like, what did we do? I'm like, I don't know. Nothing. It's just the way it is. <laughs> but yeah, and my brother had depression. And so I just feel like I am doomed. I just need to do damage control and try to like, you know, mm-hmm. just be aware of all the signs because I'm, my husband would be probably, he, I think he thinks I'm a little too pessimistic about it, but <laughs> I, I just have a very big fear. So yeah, I will talk to them about it, but I like, I'm also nervous about it too. Yeah. Has anything changed with, I know you said you weren't close with your brother, but has this changed your perspective on that relationship with him? It's interesting. Like it, it hasn't. We, we check in with each other every now and then. My sign language is unfortunately not great. So we can't really have deep conversations. But if, if we're with each other on Anne's day, or if we just want to say, Hey, I'm still feeling sad, but, but we never really talked about it. And I don't, I, so I really don't know at all. And this is embarrassing to say now that I'm saying it out loud. I don't know how he grieved. I don't know what his process was. I don't even know if my mm. mom or my parents know what his process was. I'm sure she would know more than yeah. me, but yeah. So that's really, yeah, sad too. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting you use grieved in the past tense. Do you feel that you're still grieving? Oh, that's a really Interesting question. Yes and no. Before, the grief was always like I would hold it together at work Mm -hmm. and I would just like I shouldn't have even been driving. I would just be like driving. My commutes were like 
my cry sessions because I had a baby at home, so I couldn't cry at home. Mm-hmm. So it was huh, 20 minutes to just have the waterworks go in. And it was all the time. So I was like constantly grieving. And then it was waves, very strong grief waves and then lesser. Mm-hmm. And now it's like you can't think can't think about one thing all the time, right? So I'm a mom. I'm super mm-hmm. busy. I grieve when I think about her. As you can see from this podcast, if it comes up, it is all right there just waiting for me. <laughs> it never goes away in that sense, but it does go away in the sense that I am not thinking about it on a regular basis. And part of me wonders if that's because my relationship with Anne involved so many years of just on and off connection. There would be a m- months or a mm-hmm. year go by where we didn't have a relationship, really. We just didn't talk. We were doing our own thing. And so, you know, I listened to some of your other interviews and that wasn't the case for everybody. So a lot of me just living my life without thinking about Anne is also a part of my history with Anne, alive or not. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that changes I mean, how I grieve. I... Possibly, but I think there's also this normalization of grief that we can do here where you're far enough out that it's not still new. It's still fairly new, right? Seven years isn't that long in the grand scheme of things. But there's this one way of thinking or model of grief that we talk about loss orientation and restoration orientation and that we bounce back between them. And what that means basically is that some days we're oriented to the loss and the grief and all of the way that impacts us. And sometimes we're oriented to the way that we are basically living life. I'm going to simplify it. And that they're never gone. They're just, we're switching back and forth between them. And, and that's mm-hmm. what I hear you describing very well. Like if I couldn't have taken what you said and made it more of an example of this whole (laughs) grief model. And so I just want to share that with you because I also hear you comparing yourself to other people and we don't need to do that. We can just normalize that grief is not the same for everybody. (laughs) Yeah. No, you're totally right. That's what it is. It's like never not there. It's just, I guess I have more of What's the word? Not agency. That's not the right word. But I, I guess I have a little more say in when the grief happens. It's not as out of control. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, I'm going to think about Anne and I want to. And it's I'm going to be sad. I'm going to have this interview. Mm-hmm. This is intentional. Or I see something that reminds me of mm-hmm. her and I'm going to let myself have a moment. But it's not like, yeah, it's not so at the surface. It, yeah, you're right. It comes and it goes. And as more time goes by, the coming is less than it was. Yeah. So it sounds like you're learning to live with the grief instead of the grief mm-hmm. controlling you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You to, and my mom, same. like, because I, I love how you're like, I'm going to think about it now. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. And then with my parents, I think it's, it, it's way more there than it is not there. Like it, it's very much changed my mom for sure. And my dad also, but like mm-hmm. my mom, when I ask her, how are you about Anne? It's just, there's a hole in her heart, you know, and she's, she's doing amazing. Like she is living her life and, but it's like, there's some kind of different quality to it. And I think it's probably mm-hmm. the same with my dad, but just not as obvious. So I don't know. It's interesting because now that I'm a mom and I had a sibling loss, I don't know. Like, I cannot even imagine losing my children. So I think it's interesting listening to your podcast because it's like, yeah, there's a lot of people who are concerned about the parents and always asking about the parents and not checking in so much with the siblings, which is totally the case with us, especially even more so for my brother. So that was very real. And at the same time, I get it. I don't really blame people because there's something when I look at my mom and my dad, it's like their grief is different than mine. And again, this is just my family, right? This isn't for all families. There might be siblings who have way harder grief problems Mm -hmm. than the parents. It just depends on the family situation. And in ours, it never makes me feel like, oh, I can't talk about my grief because mine's not as important. It just feels Mm -hmm. different the way I, I don't want to use the word moved on, but the way I carry it now versus the way my parents carry it now. Right. Well, I think that's an important distinction is that it is different, right? It's not it's not the same as parent loss or child loss. It's sibling loss. 
And it's just different. It doesn't mean that it's better or harder or easier or any of those things. It just is. Mm -hmm. Has and like seeing your parents change also feels like a loss. It, yeah, it does. But I don't want to say that out loud because like I don't want them to feel ever bad about it. It's just I definitely I just feel so sorry. (laughs) Yeah. Nobody deserves it, right? But they loved her so much and they tried so hard mm-hmm. in all the ways they could with all the tools of the 80s and 90s, which are not as good as the tools of today, but that's what they had. Right. And they, they tried. And like, mm-hmm. it's just, it's just heartbreaking. Because, yeah, I love them so much. Yeah. I just wish the last, like, the last time my dad saw her was his 70th birthday. So the last, hopefully, 30 years of life are, are going to be without his child. Like, they outlived their, their child. And I just, that's not how you want your retirement to be, where mm-hmm. you have this hole in your heart. But it's also just life. Like, this tragedy happens. So it's not, I don't know. It's just, I just feel really mm-hmm. sad that it happened. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't blame her. Nobody blames her. But it's just unfortunate. And I I swear my children were the saving grace. Like my mom had basically, I had three months maternity leave after Milo was born. And she she was going to watch him for a year after that just to to keep him with family. And she was excited about it. And then Anne died. And I was like, mom, I don't, I don't know if you can watch Milo. This is crazy. You need mm-hmm. to deal with your grief. And she was like, no, no, no. I need Milo. Like this. Mm-hmm. He, and and they have a very special bond. Milo may not know about it as in the same way she does, but she's <laughs> she looks at Milo and she just remembers how he got her through those that first year, which is really mm-hmm. beautiful. But so yeah, I'm really grateful that that my kids are a huge distraction for them. If I and also they love them, but if I didn't have children, right. I honestly think it would be so much harder for them to move on. Not not move on. I hate that term. I just I don't know the better term, but like yeah. Yeah, to live with the sadness. Moving forward, I think, is a... Yeah. Yeah, there you go. What do you miss most about her? The random phone calls. (laughs) We would just call each (laughs) other or text each other, like, in the middle of the night with whatever was on our mind. And she was just so... She was a little, like... I don't want to say... You know, when sometimes, and this is not going to sound very nice of me or good, good natured, but like sometimes you just are annoyed by people and you just want to poke a little fun in a safe space. And Anne was just the first mm-hmm. one to be like, because she was a flight attendant. So she had a million stories of annoying passengers and ridiculous people she worked with and just the best stories. They were just hilarious and like funny and just rude and things that you would never say yourself, but you're, I'm just going to call Anne and Mm. just, just let her, just let her go off on some things. And it was always just brilliant. And she could have been a comedian. So it was really fun just talking to her. And she was very like, uh, I I can't even really describe the way she talks with, especially without using any swear words, but (laughs) it's just, she was just spunky. (laughs) You're fine to swear if you want. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, I I definitely miss that. And just talking about our parents and our little gripes and our little, oh my God, mom did this or Mm -hmm. papa's just, you know, always in loving ways, but just in a very relatable Mm -hmm. way. Yeah. I think those are, those are the big things. The happy times, the fun times are definitely missed. Yeah. Well, speaking of happy times, do you have any favorite memories that you want to share with us? Yeah, but it's going to make her sound like (laughs) such a terrible person and she's totally not but first of all she was always really supportive like she was just so protective of me despite I swear to god she hated me for 15 years and maybe it was reciprocal because nobody likes to be hated right so but so despite those hard years like if I had a boyfriend that she didn't I'm not saying I liked this but she would just rip into them like in front of me to their face like challenging them on stuff and to them they were just like she is a bitch. And I'm like, no, she's just testing you. She's just making sure that you are, you're going to hold your own and you're going to come back with something clever and you're going to say the right thing. I knew her. So she just had this way of just like being protective and being just like, so I don't know, 
so challenging at the same time. And so I always appreciated that. I'm like, in her own way, she very much loves me. And this is how she shows it by just being really, really protective of her little sister. And yeah, we used to live together, I think, summer after my first year of college in New York City. And that was just a blast. She took me to dance clubs and just showed me the town and I would borrow her clothes and she would put makeup on me and I'm not like a makeup-y person, but she was just like, you're going to do this and really like got me out of my shell in a lot of ways and just showed me a world that I didn't really know existed. And yeah, she was just fearless. The girl was fearless. That was fun. Hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. Are there ways that you wish people would have supported you or mental health professionals or anyone that you wish they had known how to support you differently? I don't know. Again, at the time, it was just something I didn't really expect from people. I just felt like I just had this knowing that I just need to get through this like myself. Mm -hmm. I think I certainly didn't want to be rushed. I wanted it to be okay to cry about it. And to be sad and not to feel mm-hmm. like there was a timeline on my healing. And yeah, I just, I felt I am, I am the hurt one. I get to decide when I cry, how I cry, where I cry, who I talk to, mm-hmm. what I do to make me feel better. And I you know I think we emailed a little bit about this, but like, I didn't always get that in my home life for my husband, like, mm-hmm. cause he, would have handled things very differently because he and I are very differently on an emotional level. I think I should have just listened to my own heart and my own gut. And so, yeah. And at the same time, he was totally overwhelmed by my feelings and Mm. they were affecting my mothering. I was sad. I was crying a lot. And Milo was seeing me crying. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, yeah, people cry. Life is hard sometimes. Like, Mm -hmm. it's good he's seeing this. And his mind is like, oh, this is, we don't want this. We're supposed to be happy. This is a happy time. We've got a little Mm -hmm. baby. We're happy. And I'm like, not really. (laughs) So Yeah. uh, Yeah. I think just, I think that's the best, like the best thing would have been for people to just be like, wherever you're at, we can handle it. We can handle your sadness. Mm -hmm. I felt like people couldn't handle my sadness. And that was, yeah. So. Because that's the sadness is what I knew would get me through. Allowing myself to be as sad as I wanted is what would clear. That's the cleansing process of grief, right? If you feel like you can't Mm -hmm. let those feelings out because you're not in a safe space to do it and you have to put on a happy face, it's really going to add insult to injury. So that was my the hardest part is feeling like I had to put on a happy face at work. I had to put on a happy face because I'm a mom. And I'm supposed to be happy and I'm supposed to be happy with my husband. And and it's not like he was saying, you need to get over this, but I was making him uncomfortable and it was obvious. So Mm -hmm. it felt like the same thing (laughs) as feeling like I needed to get over it. It makes, it makes sense because you're, you have this very devastating event of losing your sister and at the same time the new life of your son, balancing those out is difficult, like life and death in the same space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the important message that I loved about what you said is that I'm going to grieve my own way and I wish people would have let me cry. But yeah, I I appreciate that perspective because I think that's something a lot of people lose sight of is everyone grieves differently and we can let you grieve the way that you need to grieve. And I might grieve differently and somebody else might grieve a different way and that's all okay. And even if it's the same person. So thank you for that perspective. Is there anything else you wanted to share? Yeah. I don't, I don't know why people don't talk about sibling relationships and sibling grief more because sibling relationships are very whole relationships. They're not just little pieces of something it's it's an entire dynamic whole relationship yeah thank you thank you so much for listening our theme song was written by joe millwood and brian dean and was performed by joe millwood if you would like more information on the broken pack go to our website 
thebrokenpack.com. Be sure to sign up for our newsletter, Wild Grief, to learn about opportunities and receive exclusive information and grieving tips for subscribers. Information on that, our social media, and on our guests can be found in the show notes wherever you get your podcasts. Please like, follow, subscribe, and share. Thanks again. You're second guessing, or you never know, you just never know.